Mu Sigma got started, Microsoft became our first customer. And uh, uh, it took us about eight, nine months to start that. Uh, and after that, uh, we've not looked back. Today, we are the world's largest big data company. We work with uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Microsoft, eBay, uh, Walmart, Citibank, AIG, across 10 different industry verticals, the largest retailer, the largest software company, uh, the largest PC manufacturers, the largest banks, the largest insurance companies. For all of these guys, we are helping them use data and create a better art of problem solving. We are not in the business of solving specific problems. We are in the business of creating a better art of problem solving. I'll give you an example. Solving specific problems is you come to me and say, I want some upma. I say, here is upma. That is solving specific problems. Art of problem solving is saying, when you come and ask me upma, I say, you know what? I know you want upma, but I think I can help you manage your entire kitchen differently where you can make lots of things. And I'll say, you'll say, but you'll say, that's all okay. Give me upma. I'll say, okay, I'll give you upma, but listen to how I'm doing what I'm doing. And then I'll give you the upma, but show you how I'm doing stuff. And then next day you'll come and say, I want kesari. When you ask me kesari, I say, you, you know, remember we made upma? Same kind of techniques we are going to use, but here, little different. We are going to use sugar instead of salt, and we're going to give you kesari. Third or fourth time, you won't be thinking of me as an upma company or a kesari company. You will be thinking of me as a kitchen management company. We are an art of problem solving company. And we believe the world needs a different way of solving problems. And let me, let me make a business case to you as to why the world needs that. Right? So let's actually step a little bit back. And let's see what's happening in the world overall. I feel that all human beings, the day they are born, they start their journey towards their death. All organizations, the day they are born, they start their journey towards their death. All species, the day they are born, they start their journey towards their extinction. Now, I, mean, I just took your, I got your attention. I can clearly see that. What the hell? You know? <laughs> that is the only constant. There was an, a very nice uh, example. Somebody said that the time to, uh, the time to uh, extinction is reducing for organizations in Fortune 500. In the last thing example, they laid it out very, very nicely. So I wanted to understand what I could learn from extinction first. And it is very interesting. I invested in a company. Being an entrepreneur, I also invest in other companies. And mostly, I lose money. You know? so, uh, but you get to learn a lot by losing money. You, know? you, you don't get to learn as much by, you know, uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, by faith. So this company, uh, it is all in genetics. And, uh, and I put money into that. And uh, I got to work with a German genetist as part of that. What he was telling me, what he was teaching me, was that, <clears throat> look, uh, you know, 500,000, 600,000 years before the mammoth died, the gene was predicting that the mammoth is going to die. If you read the gene, if you could map the gene and you could read the gene, it was telling you that the mammoth is going to die. The chances of death was, became higher and higher. When you read a 500-year-old 500, 500 mammoth gene, uh, 500,000 years before, if you read the mammoth gene versus 300,000 years before, 200,000 years before, 100,000 years, you could clearly see the pattern was showing that the chances of extinction was increasing. Can you imagine the repercussions of what that means? You could actually tell, based on looking at human genes, what are the chances of our extinction, and how many years will be there before which we become extinct. That's a fascinating thought process, actually. And what he learned from all his work is pretty much 
I'll summarize that to you. It costed me $500,000 because that's how much I put into that company. So it's cheap, free for you. So <laughs> the, 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 three, the things that he learned was the first thing is that if you don't scale, you will become extinct. You need to scale. You know, the num your number has to go up, 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 up. Unless your number goes up, there is a higher chance that you will become extinct. Simple, that is intuitive. Nothing, I mean, that should not cost you this much money here. <laughs> the second thing that he said was that if you don't have diversity, there is a higher chance that you will die. Something will happen if you're one of the same, there is a higher chance that you will die. And the interesting thing between these two things is that the things that help you scale actually don't help you with diversity. And the things that help you with diversity don't help you with scale. For example, asexual reproduction helps you scale very fast. You don't need to do dating, you don't need to do arranged marriages, you don't need to go through horoscopes, nothing like that. Very quickly you reproduce asexually, you don't even need the other person. Sexual reproduction helps you have diversity on a constant basis and it's not as efficient. You know, the, uh, though India has shown that we have higher capability in that than most other countries. The thing was that having both these things together is like having the cake and eating it too because one doesn't help the other. So the perspective was that having the ability to have scale and diversity together, not as a balance, but as a harmony. There's a big difference between balance and harmony. Balance is if you have one, you don't have the other. Harmony is that if you will have both and one will make each other better. Work and life balance is that I have work or I have life. Work-life harmony is that I don't feel like I am working when I am living. Right? I don't, I'm just living and I enjoy it so much. If you play tabla and I play guitar or drums, balance is that when I play drums, you don't play. And when you play guitar, I, I stop playing. But harmony is the jazz. When you play, I keep watching for your notes. And when you're in the right note, I start playing and you start enjoying. And you start saying, that's great. I'm going to change the tune now and I start changing. And I change the tune and you start, that is harmony. So the ability to create harmony between scale and diversity comes from what you call as interactions with your habitat. How you interact with various things in nature. How you interact with your ecosystem. So these three things are what, how, how you have that leads to your thriving or your extinction in nature. The same, actually the interesting part is that the same three things are important in, in, uh, in business also. If you don't have scale, you're going to die. If you don't have different ways of doing things constantly, you're going to die. And if you don't have the harmony between these two things, you're going to die. So to get to this, you need to have these three things. So with that perspective, we started looking at businesses, looking at Fortune 500 companies on a constant basis and we were looking at it because we were actually analyzing what was happening within all these Fortune 500 companies. Can you imagine what we are doing for every company in the world as they are helping them make better decisions, we are actually sitting in Bangalore and becoming the operation center of helping each of them making decisions and understanding their data in supply chain, in marketing, in risk, in R&D, in product. We are helping them solve many, 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 many different problems, but we are not in the business of that. We are in the business of art of problem solving. So we are creating this new art of problem solving which helps them deal with this. What we learned in this, to have these kind of things, is that you need a different way of thinking about life. 
What's happening with scale is that most organizations are adopting a tremendous amount of complexity. Complexity is the name of the game. You're not solving one problem. You're solving many, many problems. You think you're solving supply chain, optimizing supply chain. No, it's not optimizing supply chain. You're solving inventory management. You're solving replenishment. You're solving collaborative planning. You're solving pricing. You're solving forecasting. And if you take each of these problems, they are in 10 different problems. It becomes complicated really, really fast. Complexity is the nature of the beast with a world that is changing faster and faster and faster. Rate of change is now higher. As complexity is becoming faster and faster, what happens? In all these organizations, in all these Fortune 500 companies, it's not that these companies you know, lack capital for good ideas. It's not that these companies lack talent. They have fantastic talent. These companies all lack time because nothing gets done in time. Highly complex organizations, complexity eats time for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, for chai, in chart in between. Complexity is eating time because every day people are just sitting with each other and getting aligned with each other. First we'll get aligned, then we'll figure out how to do work. Seems familiar, I guess, for all of you guys. So how do you deal with complexity? How do you be in pursuit of simplicity and not just be simplistic? Real simpleness, you know, comes on the other side of complexity. This is simplistic and this is simple. But to understand, to move from simplistic to simple, you need to appreciate complexity. You need to see what is happening in your ecosystem. You need to understand how various things are happening and you need to be able to map your complexity. So what Mu Sigma does when we work with organizations is that we are able to you know, map their complexity using something called as the Mu Universe, where we say that in a real complex world, what we find is that clean data, good data, connected data is a utopian concept. It just doesn't exist. Your world is chaotic, your data will be chaotic. We all want this one source of truth. How many times your IT has come and told you, sir, give me some more money, we'll give it to IBM, we'll put a data warehouse, we'll put that data warehouse and put everything into one place and it'll become truthful. It doesn't become truthful because data is a representative of what happens in your life. There are various subjective realities. There's a subjective reality of marketing, there's a subjective reality of supply chain, there is a subjective reality of risk, Within all those subjective reality, you have to somehow get to objective decision making. So is analytics and data deci de database decision making actually a science or is it a language? Most people think of it as a science. It could very well be thought of as a language, a context sensitive yet objective language through which various business units can collaborate with each other and help them make better decisions. So in a way, what we felt was that if you take these problems, you take supply chain or you take marketing here and you just zoom in, you know, what you find is that marketing is segmentation, recency, frequency analytics, customer lifetime value. Problems are like children. First child, easy to manage. Two children, more than double the trouble. By the time you get to 15 children in the classroom, the interaction effects become very, very difficult. What we are seeing in organizations is that they are used to one form of problem solving, which is mostly what is called as analysis thinking. I have a problem. I will find out what that problem is. I'll find out more about that problem. I'll, I'll look for the right hypotheses. I will come back to you with what data can, what questions to ask, what data is needed, and then I'll come back with a solution. That is analysis thinking. But what we think the future wants of us is systems thinking which is based on complexity, science, chaos theory, system dynamics, where you look at it and say that, hey, I have this one problem. What, what are the connecting problems? He had a co complex, complexity problem there. It is not one problem, one solution. I have one problem. I have one uh, rule, the book that is given to me. But on the real field, 
it is a complex problem. I have to think about it holistically. I have to see what the connections are. I have to make a judgment call in the real field, which is not aligned with the rule book. And you, every day as leaders, all of you are faced with that. Your world looks like this. Your brain looks like this. You're making those connections today. What we find is that each dot here represents intelligence. But the connections between various dots represents consciousness. We mistake intelligence for consciousness. Consciousness is the ability to observe the self, that which illumines the mind. Intelligence focuses on answers. Consciousness focuses on asking better questions. Intelligence helps you feel comfortable because you're getting answers. Consciousness makes you uncomfortable. It, through that discomfort, it allows you for something very, very beautiful, but very undervalued, which is called as the discovery of ignorance. Hame pata nahi hai, but hame pata hai ki hame pata nahi hai. I don't know what I don't know. I, you know, that place is ignorance. And that's blissful. I know what I don't know is the discovery of ignorance and that is very discomforting. That creates tremendous amount of anxiety. When that anxiety is there, there's two ways to deal with that. Again, you go back to ignorance or you come somehow say, I will deal with this anxiety. I will create productive anxiety and come back with a better solution through going through the complexity and making a simple you know, thought process. So our perspective is that organizational consciousness is something that we can develop throughout the world. And that's what we are helping you know, organizations do on a day-to-day -day basis. If I had the video, you know, I don't think I have it, uh, what I would have shown you is a video of a casino. In that casino, I'm going to try to you know, it make you imagine that. And you have to believe me. So in that casino, a blackjack is being played. Have you ever seen the thing blackjack? As blackjack is being played, the question to us was that, hey, maybe there is collusion between the dealer and the player, and there may be cheating that is going on. Can you somehow figure out if there is cheating that is going on? There is lots of cameras. Can you somehow figure out that's cheating going on or not? We have lots of data that we are capturing in a casino. Las Vegas, you go, there's lots of, lots of data. It's a big business. But, you know, what we did was put miniature cameras in each blackjack table. And what you would have seen is that as the player is being playing, we actually not only figure out what, the, what cards he's getting, what his betting patterns are, whether he's winning or losing, if there is any unnatural patterns in betting or this thing, all of that we would have shown you, right? Now, you might say, wow, so this is a fraud problem, right? So this fraud problem that you have, you're trying to solve it. No. Well, the reality of the world is that the world is changing so fast. Things are happening faster and faster. And the, it is not just a fraud problem. Because let's say if John is committing fraud, you catch him for fraud. But if John is not committing fraud, even then, you are seeing so many interesting things about Don, John. You're seeing he's winning, he's losing. What is his attitude towards winning and losing? And all of this information is useful. It is connected to other problems. Because we have mapped the Mu universe and we have the systems thinking perspective, when somebody is winning a lot, that is a great time for the casino, as he's having a euphoric moment of a win, to give him a real-time offer to go and see a show or buy some jewelry. If he's losing a lot and feeling bad about it, give him an offer for a comp off on a room so that he doesn't feel as bad. More and more people are going to Las Vegas not for gaming, but for entertainment. And in that world, where people are going less for gaming and more for entertainment, Understanding and managing customer engagement is going to become very, very important and all of this happening in real time. We have technology that we have created which will take a picture of you for 30 seconds. And by the way, that technology is there. So I'll end it a little bit a little earlier and Dipinder can show you that. You can just huddle around him and see it. It will take a picture of you for 30 seconds. 
30 seconds, it'll take a picture of you, nothing else, and it'll tell you what your heart rate is. Scary shit, right? So what happens, how does we do that? No magic, there is no magic, there's no Houdini here. What is happening is the camera is capturing your face and there is something called as flush on your face. Your blood is going up, coming down, coming, going up, coming down. The rate of change of flush is directly proportional to your heart rate. So as long as you have the rate of change of flush and I can capture that, I can capture your heart rate. Now the interesting thing is, I can also go and this, and look at how your face is frowning. So you have different faces here. But the interesting pattern is that the face has certain characteristics. It has certain muscles, it has certain eyes, it has certain noses, it has certain frown. So he, his face is like this, so it's curious. His face is like this, it's anxious. Somebody said, so micro expressions on your face are being captured. A combination of micro expressions on your face and the data and the heart rate is your emotion. So Walmart store of the future, we are actually capturing a combination of those two things and at the aisle, we are telling them the mood of the consumer. We are moving from the nature of data is changing. Most data today, what you know is post-intent data. I bought something, data got created. I called somebody, data got created. The nature of data is changing to pre-intent data. As data is moving from post-intent to pre-intent, the nature of decisions are going to change. <coughs> so that perspective means that how are you going to deal with that world? And here is my thought process on that. That in that world, certain paradigms that we are living by, right? If you look at the world, okay? I'm gonna use two colors. The black is the old color and the red is the new color. If there was a fact, an anti-fact, in anything. Something is true, something is not true. The world before was something like this. It took some time for the fact to become an anti-fact, to become a fact, and so on and so forth. How would you assume the new world is? Like this. Right? This is the nature of change. Time is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. My father, if he was supposed to sit for 30 minutes in a room, he'll say, I'll do it. When I am sitting for 30 minutes in a room, I'm saying, 30 minutes, you want me to sit in a room? Fine, I'll sit, but you know, I'll at least have my smartphone next to me, I'll do something with it. My son, if you ask him to sit for 30 minutes in a room, are you joking? Well, the nature of time has changed. 30 minutes before was half an hour. 30 minutes, 30 minutes before was half an hour, 30 minutes now is 30 minutes, 30 minutes tomorrow is 1,800 seconds. The nature of time is changing because the nature of data is changing, the nature of what is being captured is changing. What that means is that time to untrue, a fact becoming an anti-fact, you know, time to untrue is now much shorter. Time to untrue today is much, much shorter in that world Everything is being destroyed. Shiva is happening on the world faster and faster and faster. Because Shiva is happening, more space is getting created for Brahma to come and create new things. And Vishnu is saying, which one to keep and which one not to keep? This means that that world is one where if I were to tell you that knowledge management is a bad thing, many of you will look at me and look at the, what? Knowledge management is a bad thing? Yes, I feel knowledge management is a bad thing in that new world. Eulogizing what you know too much comes in the way of what you can learn. Learning is D by DT of knowledge. The rate of, you can, yeah, it's having a tiring day. So, <laughs> that's okay. Learning is D by DT of knowledge.
things are changing so fast that if you want to be understanding how knowledge is changing faster and faster and faster. And this might sound shocking to you. In that world, it's not experts who ask the right questions. It is having childlike curiosity and having the ability to constantly ask better and better questions with extreme experimentation. Extreme experimentation and bringing down the cost of experimentation to such a level. And that's why India is going to be very important for the world. Because we can send a rover to Mars at one-fifth of the making the movie's gravity. So the nature of experimentation is making us interesting for them. So all these companies are working with us, making us their innovation garage. And in that world, the new IP is not keeping things secretive. If you know something, don't keep it secretive. Let ideas spread and make love to other ideas. The more ideas spread and make love to other ideas, new ideas get created, new babies of ideas get created. Data is a very social animal. Data wants to be social. It doesn't like to sit alone. It wants to go to other data and say, hey, can I be your friend? And it mixes with that other data and makes you think. So data by its very nature is a social animal. So the new IP is not intellectual property which is making things closeted, but interdisciplinary perspective, which is seeing the same problem through multiple disciplines. Through math, through business, through technology, through behavioral science, through design thinking. The future worker is not a business analyst. It is not an applied mathematician. It is not a programmer. It is a mixture of all of these things. The reality is that the future worker will look very, very different from the current day worker. And that's already happening. 20 years back, there was a role called the typist. Today, everybody types. Everybody will program. Everybody will do applied mathematics. It will become easier and easier and easier. You may not believe it. It is happening. Well, Musigma is making it happen. The future is one where these three roles the business analyst, the applied mathematician, and the programmer will come together to be the data scientist or the decision scientist. Now, this sort of talent is not available in the world, anywhere in the world. So you can't even recruit for this from educational institutions. So we are actually creating them. So we have a program called Musigma University, which consists of three parts. The first part is the basics of design thinking, storyboarding, structured problem solving. How do you ask good questions? It's like a boot camp. You said we don't have a boot camp in India. There is one boot camp. It's called Mu Sigma. It's a tough, bloody boot camp. Many people, you know, you'll, you'll find that it's a, it's the three years they spend in Mu Sigma, they'll find, oh, shit. You know, it's a mental boot camp. The second part is a core curriculum in analysis and analytics, all the way from univariate, bivariate, multivariate to applied regression, Bayesian modeling, structural equation modeling, latent class analysis. Techniques from statistics, econometrics, operations research. Tools from business intelligence to big data. And we made tools which enable people with a quantitative bent of mind function like a master's or a PhD in applied mathematics. We realized that there are not enough masters and PhDs in applied mathematics in the world, not just here. So we didn't follow the Superman model. Let's get these special people. That's not going to work. We didn't also follow the robot model. The machine will solve the whole problem. We followed the Iron Man model. We built a lot of software, and then we have a human being working within that context. And the last part is like a mini MBA for the quantitatively inclined. How to fake an MBA for an engineer. So every person goes through three and a half months of Musigma University, followed by about 18 months of practical training. This year, 600 of our customers from the 140 Fortune 500 clients are coming to Bangalore to get trained on Musigma University. Bangalore is not the place where you send work to because we don't want to do it. Bangalore is the place where you go to so that you can learn. People are coming from San Francisco. People are coming from Bentonville. People are coming from Chicago. And we are making them learn here. It is something we very, very, we are very proud of that. So the, so, the, so the thought process is that only can happen with this perspective. Learning over knowing, extreme experimentation, 
the interdisciplinary perspective, taking risks. So that's, you know, my talk to you guys is what can be possible. Today, for GE, we got the Chairman's Award from GE. I, could, I can show you that video also. It's there here. Basically, it is, it is, uh, it is you know, a lot of these machines are creating tons and tons of data. Some of these uh, machines are becoming more and more dangerous. Can you predictively to say that which machines are going to fail, which machines are going to blow up? All of these things we are doing for them. So we're looking at machine data, we're looking at marketing data, we're looking at sales data. We are combining math, business, technology. We are creating that future worker who's not purely a man, he's also a man and a machine. And getting these people to be a company which has a better art of problem solving, which is these three principles, so that they will have a higher chance of thriving and not becoming extinct. 